Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at TexasConflictCoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TXConflictCoach. Well, tonight we kick off a whole new series this month, and in our episode, The Gratitude Opportunity, Expressing Gratitude at the Best and Worst Times, is based on the research and work of Dr. Ross Brinkert. Now, gratitude communication involves expressing appreciation or thanks to others. That's not new, but we're going to hear powerful, real-life stories of individuals who have shared moments of gratitude in their work lives. We're going to take away tips to guide you in your own life, whether handling a difficult situation or simply savoring a situation that's already been amazing. Now, Dr. Ross Brinker is an associate professor of corporate communication at Penn State University in Abington. Ross recently completed a three-year research project on gratitude communication in the workplace and is currently writing a book titled The Gratitude Opportunity, and we'll be looking to have him back on the show when that comes out. Now, Ross is a sought-after professional speaker with over 15 years of experience and is well-known for engaging participants with customized content, a lively style, and clear and practical takeaways. We are taking live callers' questions and comments. Simply call us at 347-324-3591 or join us in our chat room, which we have open now. Simply go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash Texas-conflict-coach and you'll scroll down. You'll see the chat room is open. Or if you want to follow us on the Twitter feed, use hashtag TCCRadio. Ross! Welcome to our program tonight. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Patty. I'm a big fan of your work, and it's just a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, I've been, I, I feel so blessed to have met you a number of years ago at the Association for Conflict Resolution, and I, I think we were on a conflict coaching uh, panel, and of course your book, you know, Conflict Coaching, the original Conflict Coaching book, I mean, so your, your work has been, you know, leading and blazing the way in a lot of things, and so I guess... My question to you is, with all the work you've been doing, conflict, conflict coaching and communication, what has steered you, what has motivated you right now to do this study on gratitude? Because that's a very interesting element to conflict. Absolutely. And what's interesting is, is that I, I did this without even expecting it really to be tied to conflict. I, I'd come to a point in my career where I'd earned tenure in my university and, and actually wanted to take on a brand new project. At the same time, there certainly were some key overlaps with the work I've done in the past uh, that, that, you, that you mentioned, for example, conflict coaching. And I think some of those themes uh, were relating to really work, working on identifying strengths in people's situations as well as looking at positive potentials for, for their future. So really taking a positive or, or what's called an appreciative approach to, to people's situations and then also just really working with, uh, with strategic communication, not only looking at these elements of uh, from, from maybe an individualistic point of view, but also looking at it, what they mean in terms of strategic communication, effective and appropriate communication between people. And, and how I stumbled into this really was that, you know, I did these interviews without even mentioning the word conflict, but when I, when I went back of, over these transcriptions of these hundred interviews I had on gratitude communication in the workplace, it was amazing how often that these were stories about conflict. And so uh, that's really how I came to uh, kind of connect the dots between my past work and, of course, this current project. You know, um, and I, I know that you're going to probably share a couple of these stories and some themes that were coming out of that. So it, it's interesting and ironic how you weren't intentionally going down this path of conflict, but how you were listening. You're such a good listener and listening for what were those connections. So 
Uh, so very interesting. So, but let's make sure we're all on the same page about what you mean by gratitude and gratitude communication. I think some people get that, you know, communi uh, confused with appreciation or, you know, different other words. So what do you mean by that? Great. Yeah, I, I define gratitude communication as one or more people communicating appreciation for and or thanks to one or more other people. And that really grows out of work that's been done in, in, in the gratitude area of, of, of gratitude as emotion. So the idea of gratitude has been talked about, written about for uh, centuries, uh, you know, especially from a, a spiritual religious standpoint. And over the last uh, 30 years or so, it's really been examined uh, as an emotion, gratitude as an, as an emotion, especially in people's personal lives. More recently, it's been looked at as an emotion in the workplace. Uh, but it's a fairly new, uh, a fairly new focus to look at gratitude uh, not just as an emotion and not just as something in, the per in our personal lives, but really looking at gratitude as something that we communicate or experience between people and, uh, and then really concentrate on looking at that in the workplace. So when you say gratitude is an emotion, you know, you know, so in other words like sad and happiness and anger, you're saying gratitude is not a thought or concept but an actual emotion. Right, yeah, in terms of a lot of the previous work that's been done around gratitude, especially in the field of, of what's known as positive psychology um, by people um, such as Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, they've really focused on gratitude as an emotion. They tended to focus on gratitude as an emotion. But I've really defined it from a communication standpoint, since that's my professional background. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really trained as, as a communication uh, scholar. And so I looked at it as something that was communicated between people. And so I think it's got some connection to, to gratitude as, as emotion, um, but I think it's something else, too, because I'm really very much inter interested in um, how it's sent, how it's received, uh, in terms of the nonverbal and verbal aspect of it, as well as what's going on for people from more of a, what you might say, motivational standpoint. Okay, great. All right, so thank you for kind of getting us on the same page about what you meant by that. And especially because of the focus of the communication, which is what the research through your research. So what were some of the themes that you discovered in your research about gratitude, especially in the workplace? Because it sounds like this is where you were mostly focused on. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I, I really asked people, uh, I asked people uh, five main questions. You know, tell me uh, the most powerful story of you uh, sending gratitude inside your organization over the past year. Tell me the most powerful story of you receiving gratitude inside your organization over the past year. Um, tell me um, those stories, uh, the sending and receiving stories, um, for um, for uh, with people external to your organization, with people like clients or, or vendors uh, or, or community members, and then also what's your story, uh, your most powerful story of sending or receiving gratitude communication from across your career. And in terms of types of gratitude communication, it's interesting because it's a list that I, that I, I wouldn't have necessarily come up with before I started carrying out these, uh, these interviews and, uh, and actually looking at the themes from across them. So there's sort of five main buckets that they could all get organized into. And it's a little bit analytical, but in a way it's a useful list, too, for really thinking about, you know, what do you and I tend to uh, um, express gratitude around the most? And so there's, there's efforts, there's outcomes, there's essentials, there's potentials, and there's recognitions. Now, those probably sound a little bit mysterious, so if it's okay with you, Patty, I'll, I'll drill down into those a little bit more. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, and so efforts is really, um, you know, efforts and outcomes are, I, I'd say, somewhat obvious for a lot of us in terms of we're used to sending and receiving gratitude about um, the effort that someone put out. Um, you know, you, you stayed late to get this job um, to make progress on this job, you know, so um, that, that effort piece. And it's interesting how often efforts actually are different from outcomes. So, you know, that extra time you put in, um, how hard you worked, that's an effort versus an outcome. Wow, it's amazing what you did in terms of, of bringing new, that, that new contract into our organization. 
Thank you. Um, that's really an outcome-focused uh, expression of gratitude. Essentials is really about sending or receiving gratitude that's really tied to your identity or tied to the identity of the organization. Like, Patty, you are just an amazing person. So it's, it's, so specific, it's, it's, it's general in a way, but it's so specific on you as a person beyond any specific behavior that you're doing. Potentials. Now, here's something that I didn't expect at all. Um, it's amazing how often those most powerful, those most meaningful expressions of gratitude are actually times when people recognize and are recognized for the potential they bring to their work. Um, so a real classic example of that is, is an intern in an organization and someone just expressing gratitude to that person saying, wow, you know, you've only been here three months. I just see so much promise in you if you are to stay at this organization or just work in our field in general. Um, and the last bucket is recognitions. And this is that wonderful loop that so often happens in the gratitude communication area, that idea of reciprocity, of giving and receiving. Literally, some of the most powerful times that people remember sending and receiving gratitude is for just recognition of the gratitude that's already been, been, uh, been sent or received. Um, so it's just it's, it's the idea that gratitude keeps on going, um, and people remember that. People even remember the thank you for the thank you. So what I guess as you're kind of describing these buckets, I, and I assume this is something that you named these buckets, right, from the from the research. Exactly. Yeah, these are, these are buckets that I uh, came up with based on uh, the interviews that I analyzed. And I guess. You know, it sounds like recognition was the most important. Is that what I'm hearing you say, out of all of them? Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the most important. Um, I'd say it's one of the more surprising ones for me, especially uh. because my, my questions were around not just, you know, tell me about an example of, of you sending or receiving gratitude from the past year. My question really was, tell me about your, I, I didn't use, quite use the phrase high point experience, but tell me about your most positive and memorable example of sending gratitude to someone in your organization over the last year. So I really was asking for, like, the most... Um, the most positive, the most memorable example. And some of the time, um, it, it really was, it was the thank you for the thank you. That, that, that hold, held a lot of weight for people. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put that out there over the other ones, but I think that along with the potentials one, um, the idea of recognizing someone's potential uh, at work or, or in, the, in a professional sphere in general, um, those are ones that I think were less obvious for me going in. Honestly, I didn't even speculate that they'd be on the list, um, but uh, it's amazing how often really positive and memorable gratitude involves those things. You know, having these kind of conversations, you know, being able to put yourself in a very present, authentic, total curiosity place as you're listening to these stories, you're asking these questions, there's surprises that are coming out for you. You know, just kind of reflecting back on that experience, and of course I know you're writing a book about it. I mean, what was the most impactful to you as a researcher and as a conflict management practitioner about these conversations, these interviews? Yeah, I think what was powerful, you know, were, were, was just seeing how this matters in general, you know, matters to things like loyalty and retention and, and increasing sales and better relationships and higher productivity and improved morale and so on. You know, it hooks into all these uh, topics that are just, um, you know, key uh, touchstones in our, in our professional world these days. But, but for me, what was top of the list uh, in actually carrying out those interviews was just the deep sense of personal meaning that people had in sharing these stories and that I really experienced as a listener. Uh, and, 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 I mean, just talking to you now, I get chills again, even though I've gone through these stories, you know, what feels like a thousand times now in the work that I'm doing to really analyze them closely. But, uh, you know, the fact that these are stories from the workplace and yet they tie into the speaker's most, some of the speaker's most, personally meaningful moments in their lives and, and, and just how that touched me personally. Well, especially um, and, and because they have to be I, very vulnerable to kind of share that with you. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, um, 
I, yeah, I certainly am grateful to the people who opened up to me. I've got to say, though, it's, uh, I think it's easier for me asking questions about such a positive topic. And I think for most people, it's easier answering questions about such a positive topic. But it, it is interesting how revealing it was, how in some cases intimate it was, just at the level of, of um, the depth of the emotion, the power of the emotion that was sent. And, and that sometimes, you know, given, given the theme of your, your, your talk radio program, too, of, of you know, conflict, um, the way it hooked into um, some sometimes very raw conflict themes, the way it hooked into sometimes life and death themes, uh, was extremely profound. So we're going to talk about that and go a little bit just deeper into that. And I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, people's beliefs and expectations of sending, receiving uh, gratitude and what, what you discovered from that. Before we do that, for those who are just tuning in, um, you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio program. And we're talking with Dr. Ross Brinkert about his research and his findings of gratitude communication. Now, if you if just tuning in, Ross, his initial intention when he started this research was really around conflict. It was around communication and how we, you know, define gratitude as an emotion and, and how do we send and receive communication. But he discovered in these stories from these uh, 100 interviews um, through people having these very deep personal meanings as they're sharing them with him that there was this, as you said, hook loss. Uh, two conflicts. So can you say what this hook was uh, as people were describing you're seeing the connection? What was the connection that you were hearing and discovering? Um, sure, yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. You know, I guess one way to organize those stories is just calling them essentially pre-conflict stories, during conflict stories, and post-conflict mm. stories. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think why it came up is because those conflict moments, just focusing on conflict in general, those conflict moments in our life are, are so often deeply emotionally charged, and they're so often turning points, uh, you know, hopefully for the better and sometimes not for the better. And so I think that's why people drifted into this area of, of um, you know, even with a focus on gratitude, these were kind of emotionally... Um, defined moments in, 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 in their life uh, over the past year and then even across their work life in general. You know, one example of, of, of a conflict story that was really a, given to me as a gratitude story, I didn't ask, again, for a conflict story at all. I didn't even use the word conflict. But one of the stories came up, for example, was, was, um, was, was a, a gentleman who worked in a, in a graphic design business. And, uh, and, and he was incredibly frustrated. And uh, it was a really challenging situation for him to be in because his boss was also his his uh, wife, and uh, and and he talked about how it was a really big deal for him to really confront uh, his boss slash wife about his work situation, and it was more it was more of a work situation, but there, there's no question that you know those two roles were were worked in at the same time, and he expressed his frustration about the fact that you know he felt like. You know, his abilities were being wasted. He felt like he wasn't bringing his main talent to his work and to the business. He didn't feel like he was uh, a really successful contributor or even a valued contributor. And uh, he talked about how difficult it was to voice that. He talked about all the emotions that were behind it. And he talked about how powerful it was that his wife, or his boss slash wife in that situation heard him, and one of the first things she said was, "Thank you, you know, thank you for you know who you are and what you bring," and um, and just that acknowledgement, that gratitude for for you know who he, who he was professionally, and then she went on to actually talk about how she did really. Um, also feel a lot of gratitude for his core talents and wanted to work with him on finding him a way to bring those forward in this business and kind of get him, get him away from kind of some sideline tasks that he was involved with. So there's one example of how gratitude played a key role in, in, in transitioning that relationship. Um, but at the same time, it was really a conflict story as well. You know, what's interesting is, you know, it took – for him to have this kind of 
uh, pre-conflict, if you will, or, you know, or mo moving into the kind of during conflict, which is me, he had to get to a point of his own frustration and internal conflict with his wife slash boss to even ask for what he needed or vo vocalize it. And it sounded like she was then able to uh, send uh, gratitude back to him. But I, I guess it ties back to kind of the beliefs of, what did you discover were people's beliefs or expectations, especially in the workplace, about gratitude and gratitude communication? Um, I, I'd be really curious to see or hear what those expectations or beliefs are. Yeah, again, that's, I, I think you're, you're zeroing in on something that's really assent, an essential finding for me, and that's around you know, essentially what you might call the different perspectives or even world views on, on gratitude communication. Uh, and, and, and as you might imagine, there's quite a range, uh, and I encountered quite a range. And, and I, I purposely didn't come from a judgmental place. I'm not writing it up in a judgmental way. I'm just essentially writing it up in more of a matter-of-fact way that, that on the one side, there really do seem to be people who value gratitude communication in itself so much that they truly do it from a place of, of, or they try to do it from a place of no ego, that it's really just about doing it because it's, it's important to do and it's about the other person. Um, on the far end of the spectrum, you've got other people who are open about doing it incredibly strategically for self-gain. It's really gratitude as an instrumental um, uh, effort. To, uh, to advance personal gain. And then you get people, a lot of people, you know, somewhere in the middle there where uh, there's a sense of, uh, you know, I want to acknowledge, recognize, appreciate other people. Uh, that's, that's important in itself. But, yes, it's also important and effective for me to do because uh, I'm going to get some of what's important to me in return. So I really got examples across the board there, and, and I think your question is really, really important uh, when it comes to people like conflict coaches or others who are really supporting people around choices and choice-making in conflict situations um, to recognize that, that people essentially have different perspectives and that if we're not being... Uh, directive, we need to really respect the fact that people use gratitude, uh, use gra choose to use gratitude differently. You know, what was coming to mind as you were speaking um, is, I'm, I'm sure, well, I'm just talking out loud here, what's coming to mind for me right now is, is, is I remember um, people that I've been around in workplace situations over the years, and not as a conflict coach, just me, employee, a peer, or coworker. Um, is that some people did it in such a genuine, authentic way. So that's probably that first encounter that they, they see gratitude as a value. They, it, they walk it. They incorporate it in their life. They're not trying to get something back necessarily. And you, you receive it as authentic. And then I've seen those and heard those where you know it is so insincere, has no meaning, and you know that there's something behind it, it's like there's this hidden agenda, and maybe they're even doing it to manipulate something. But did, did you hear those types of stories where they, that they cause meaning, but it was a negative meaning versus a positive meaning? Right. Uh, I, it's important to point out that my questions were really framed from a positive standpoint. So I was asking about positive and memorable stories. Nonetheless, uh, there was a lot of depth to these interviews, and so we certainly um, headed, headed into the direction that you're asking about here. You know, one person drifted into a story about how uh, the, the CEO of, of a pharmaceutical uh, company, uh, uh, kind of a fairly a relatively you know, small to medium-sized pharmaceutical company, uh, the CEO was, um, was moving on. And uh, I think he sold his interests and... And, and, he, and he spoke to the person who I was interviewing, and he, and he said, you know, I want to help you get another job because there's going to be new leadership coming in. It's likely, you know, that things will be difficult at the least for you to stay on. It uh, might be a good idea for you to proactively look at options. I want to help you out with finding another opportunity. Um, and that person 
and that person was really insincere about it. On the one hand, it really was wrapped up in gratitude, as in, I appreciate what you've done for me while we worked at the same company together. I appreciate your talents. You know, thank you for everything you did to help me succeed. I want to help you find your next opportunity. It was wrapped up in all that good gratitude stuff, but it really, you know, once we started probing this one a little bit, the person I was interviewing, she she was actually really confused and doubtful about the sincerity here because uh, because she ended up, you know, not wanting to take that opportunity. Um, then he ended up pulling away in a rather bitter way, and it seemed like. It seemed like to her, you know, who knows for certain, but it seemed like to the person I was interviewing that he just wanted her out of there to essentially um, put a knife in the person of, um, you know, who was trying to get back at and, um, and and leave the company in sort of worse shape. So, um, so there is an example of the insincerity. On the sincerity side, you know, it's so interesting from a from a from a again a coaching standpoint. I think we obviously need to consider you know sending, um, um, sending and receiving skills for the verbal and the nonverbal aspect. We need to think about just our, our personality differences, our, our identity differences, and, and just what feels right for us in terms of the kinds of things we, uh, the kind of acts. Uh, or people that we recognize, and then, of course, how we do that. Um, so I think those things are good to take into consideration. Um, and then just two other things I want to throw out there, too, are the importance of being innovative, especially if you're someone who sends gratitude a lot. I think that it can feel watered down unless you're innovative. Um, and, 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 and the importance of, of surprise as well. Oh, I'm so glad you said that about being innovative because, you know, I, I know a lot of people who say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and then they, like, you know, then they start to question, okay, is that really genuine? Like you said, it's watered down, so the importance mm. of surprise, like like what you're saying there. And I would imagine, uh, just to clarify, these interviews, were they in uh, one particular area of the United States or were they cross-culturally around various parts of the United States? Oh uh, yeah, they were they were across the the U.S. with people in uh, different levels of the organ uh, different levels of organizations. You know, frontline uh, workers, uh, managers, uh, and also uh, top leaders, um, and and uh, male, female, pretty good mix in terms of uh, racial, ethnic background. So it was a good spread of people uh, from across the U.S. at different levels. Um, and I'm sure this will come out in your book when you when you uh, produce your, your study results and things of that nature. And we're going to talk about tips uh, shortly here. Did you find that there was a cultural difference in beliefs and expectations of sending and receiving gratitude uh, communication in the United States? Yeah, great question. Uh, I didn't look at that specifically, and I think that uh, my comments are pretty anecdotal because, you know, I, I didn't uh, develop enough. Uh, data in this particular area, but it's interesting. The one thing that really jumps out at for me when you ask that question is that uh, one of the people that I talked to about this topic, who did a lot of work in the media industry in New York City, really made a point of emphasizing that things were different in New York City. Um, that's the one time when someone really emphasized that culture was a factor in the questions I was asking. Um, how he was answering. It was pretty fascinating to me. Um, basically, he was saying that it was a more cutthroat environment where people seemed to be more suspect of people expressing gratitude and that, it, from his point of view, it wasn't part of the culture. On the other hand, I talked to other people from New York City who uh, didn't get into that at all, um, you know, didn't, didn't make those same points. But it's interesting that, from a geographical perspective, culture came up in a big way for that one person around New York City um, media culture, at least. Well, and, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, having lived and grown up in uh, Texas and then moving and living in Delaware on the East Coast for nine years, my husband and I are one that genu genuinely send gratitude probably more frequently than people were used to on the East Coast. And so we then became suspect that what was behind our gratitudes, our thanks, I mean, it could be something very simple as, oh, thank you for taking out the trash, you know, or, you know, if we were with someone or an apartment, and then it just became, like you said, it became suspect. So I was curious about that cultural, cultural difference. So maybe that will be a, an addendum to your research study in the future. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really deep area, uh, and uh, it's it's fascinating to talk about, just even in terms of our individual lives. Oh, absolutely. So, so what are some very practical, you know, tips or strategies that you would like to suggest to our listeners now about sending and or receiving gratitude more effectively? You talk about being more innovative and, and, uh, and, and of course, the importance of surprise. So what are some uh, things that you would like to share with them now? Great. So even though it's, um, even though from the person receiving it, it's going to feel like a surprise, one of the tips is to even um, schedule it for yourself in advance. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, may, maybe you're going to set a goal to, Maybe you're going to set a goal to really be deliberate about sending a workplace-oriented gratitude message once a week. So um, why not, like, put those points in your calendar? Maybe pre-assign a person who you're going to uh, send gratitude to on that particular day. So just because it's a surprise for the person who's receiving it doesn't mean it has to be um, – doesn't have – that doesn't mean it has to be totally just improvised um, by you, the sender. Um, so I, I really like the idea of planning it. it it's so fascinating. Just related to this, related to this tip, is the idea too that um, that came out of my study was that some of the most successful people that I talked to um, had made this a very deliberate strategy uh, throughout their career, and, and I. So I I could see the fruits of it uh, just in, in terms of their financial success and so on. Um, and, and one of the people I talked to, I go, you know, I, I approached him because he's just a really successful business person, successful um, athlete as well. I, I knew he'd have an interesting perspective, but I'd never talked about gratitude with him before. And he goes, gratitude? Oh, I always, send, I always up, make it a goal to send uh, a minimum of 100 gratitude messages a year. Um, oh. and, and so – so here, so so the so just just an example there of possibly shooting really high. Um, I think that's probably um, too ambitious for a lot of us. But um, but people are people who are really successful. They take this really seriously. They think it through. They plan it through. They think about what kind of stationary area they're going to use. Which, by the way, is a really memorable and important part of this in terms of sending a. a a high quality message uh, if you are sending a written note as opposed to an email um, you know another tip too is um, is to really think about the value of possibly expressing thanks individually versus in public you know sometimes one can be more effective than the other um, the importance of um, of having something tangible as an expression of thanks but not but not but but possibly not doing that either. I think there's a lot of confusion out there that people only respond to a thanks when it's tied to a financial reward, especially if it's coming from the top down in an organization. I didn't find mm -hmm. that I didn't find that to be a major theme at all. So uh, basically, just to sum up, um, be planned, even though it gets experienced by people as spontaneous. You know, set some sort of numerical goal, even for a certain um, span of time, maybe even for the next month. Um, if you're a pro, you know, go maybe make it a yearly goal. Um, and then think about the public-private aspect. Think about whether um, whether there should be a tangible piece at all. Those are some tips. So clarify the, the other example of being innovative. Um, can you give an example of that? Sure. Um, you know, one example of someone being innovative uh, is – um, there's an individual uh, had a, was very successful in the financial and uh, financial industry. Um, uh, was a, a, a senior vice president in an investment firm. Uh, didn't have any compliance issues his whole career. They did a nice send off for him uh, in terms of uh, having an event where people came from across um, the region to just you know acknowledge what he'd accomplished and and to wish him well in his retirement. And one of the things they did in, in that tribute in that thank you tribute to him. Is um, uh, is someone you know someone who knew him a little bit better was aware that he loved uh, he loved to be a photographer in his spare time uh, just as a hobby, and so as part of the tribute to him, uh, they asked his wife to have access to his photos, and they put together a really beautiful little slideshow of his photos to music, and and that just deeply deeply moved and deeply touched him. Another example from that um, from someone in the financial services field. Uh, we've had a lot of extreme weather over the last few years. Um, uh, someone who was out without power for a few days, um, just in a, in a call, um, the, the investment advisor realized this person was living in really compromised conditions. 
uh, they, they basically arranged, they, they found out kind of casually what kind of pizza this person liked, and they, they made an arrangement for a pizza to be sent well over an hour to get to this person. And, and that little thing really made a difference to that woman who received it. Um, so it could be will, a lot of creative ideas. Absolutely, absolutely, and it doesn't have to be about the money. What's interesting with that last example of the pizza, the pizza in a hurricane example, is that that was a person, a client, who had a portfolio in the many millions of dollars, um, and it wasn't about, um, I don't know, it wasn't about spending, you, you, you would think, well, this person's you know, got a, a net worth that's, that's huge, we're going to have to basically do something over the top to get our attention, and we're going to have to invest money. No, it's about being thoughtful. It's about listening really closely to what people's needs are, knowing what's important to them. A another way to thank, you know, particularly wealthy people is to make a donation in their honor to a charity that you know they'll value. That touches them way more at the holiday season than, than sending them a bottle of booze. Gotcha. Okay. So very, very, very creative ways, and they don't have to be like this super, super duper creative, but some things that you know, especially if you're listening uh, to the person or know the person, um, that you can do things that really, like you said, touch them in a very meaningful way that, that sends that gratitude and, of course, the receiving of that gratitude. So we are getting ready to wind down the show, and we usually close with some kind of assignment for the week or call to action. So what is our, uh, your assignment for our listeners? Sure. My, my assignment, my invitation, my challenge to your listeners, Patty, is, is to express three types of gratitude in the coming week. Um, one, uh, be deliberate about sending gratitude to someone who is under-recognized inside your organization, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you do work or if you volunteer. Um, number two, be deliberate about sending gratitude, a gratitude message, to someone external to the organization in which you work or in which you volunteer. Um, and, and again, ex, by external I mean someone who doesn't actually work for the organization but might um, access its services or, uh, or might support the work you do in, the, in meeting your clients' needs, but they don't do it internally, so it might be a vendor. And, and the third one is, even though we haven't focused our conversation on the personal side of things directly, I really invite you, encourage you, challenge you to be deliberate about sending gratitude to someone in your personal life who you haven't expressed gratitude to any time recently, and with all three of those, really strive to be innovative and really have fun with the surprise element. And don't at all get wrapped up in the idea that it has to be about spending money. Okay, excellent. All right, listeners, you've got your challenge. And we want to hear from you uh, about how that went for you. So feel free to either comment um, on our Facebook page, which is Conflict Connections, or certainly uh, you can tweet me at TX Conflict Coach. Or for that matter, if you want to, uh, you know, send this directly to Ross, how could they contact you, Ross? Sure. The, the easiest way to contact me is, uh, is by sending me an email, uh, uh, Ross Brinkert at uh, psu.edu, so R-O-S-S-B-R-I-N-K-E-R-T at PSU for Penn State University dot edu. Or, or uh, you could go to, to, to Patty's page, uh, Texas Conflict Coach uh, radio program page and uh, and just connect with me through um, just the notice for this particular program. Thanks, Patty. Uh, well, absolutely. We have opportunities for people to post comments directly on your show page, like you said, at TexasConflictCoach.com. Um, also, all the shows are archived there, so you'll be able to also download uh, Ross's show today and also leave your comments there. Um, now, you, uh, on Ross's uh, show page is also his direct link to his website, uh, at Penn State Abington, so you'll be able to get more information there as well. Now, anything, do you have any trainings or anything that you're doing around your findings uh, that you want uh, the listeners or the public to know about and also talk about when you expect to publish your findings in your new book? Great. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I have um, I have. Uh, different kinds of presentations I do on this topic, uh, from 20-minute uh, to one-hour keynotes to half-day trainings to full-day trainings, uh, and, and to do those as 
um, customized events for particular audiences, say managers, frontline professionals, um, sales professionals, customized to, to specific sectors like the financial services, healthcare, uh, and other areas. Um, and uh, the best way to get a hold of me is, is again, probably by, the, by email. Um, and uh, I, I have uh, Penn State Continuing Education actually handle the details on those. But you can get in touch with me, and then I'll get in, uh, get you in touch with um, with the, the event planner for that, even if you just have more questions about those opportunities. Um, I'm hoping that uh, for the book to be out uh, in September 2015, I'll definitely keep you posted, Patty. Um, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate this call today. And uh, And who knows, hopefully we can connect again when it gets closer to the launch as well. Oh, we would love to have you uh, back on the show to expand on that. And are there any current white papers or articles from your findings that, uh, so far that people can access? Um, right. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm still uh, I'm still in the early stages of this. Uh, uh, okay. uh, yeah. So, but I do encourage people to reach out to me if they're interested uh, in terms of just you know in general. Uh, you know, for the workplace, for the work world, or if they come from, come at, at things possibly from more of an academic point of view, uh, because I do have some uh, presentations coming up on both sides in the next um, in the next six months, and I'll be glad to share those things uh, once um, once once they're actually published. I can send a link and things like that. Perfect. Okay. Well, folks, again, you can reach Ross at Ross R O S S B R I N K E R T at PSU, Penn State University edu. Again, all his contact information will be on the show page. I want to thank you so much, Ross, for being part of our program. I, I'm just so excited. Finally, uh, we were able to get you on and to talk about such an important topic. What final message do you want to leave with listeners? Um, gratitude really matters. That it's about some of the most meaningful times in our life uh, as a sender and a, a, and as a receiver, uh, and so. Um, Embrace that sense of meaning. Make, make use of that sense of meaning. Um, thanks so much, Patty. You're so welcome. All right. Good night, listeners. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at TexasConflictCoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.